Good evening. Welcome everyone to our digital glaucoma support group. Thank you for joining. Uh, so tonight's session is all about laser treatment for glaucoma. I'm Joanna Bradley, Head of Support Services at Glaucoma UK. Our speaker this evening is Mr. Dan Linfield. He's a consultant ophthalmologist and glaucoma lead at Royal Surrey County Hospital. A uh, um, and he's a sorry, and he's a training program director for ophthalmology for Health Education England in Kent, Surrey, and Sussex. Dan will be talking through the different types of laser treatment and how they work and why you might be recommended one for your glaucoma. I'm so glad so many of you have chosen to spend your evening with us. And I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about the format of today's talk and the technical side of Zoom. So just to go through the technicals of how this Zoom group will work. We can't see or hear audience members, but you should be able to see and hear me and Dan. We're also being streamed live on Facebook. And if you're watching there, you can ask questions by commenting on the feed on Facebook. There'll be two short polls launched during this webinar as well. These are to help us see the difference the sessions are having and if you feel you're learning things. I'm going to launch the first one now and this will stay open for about a minute or two. If you're having technical difficulties, try turning off other devices which are connected to the Wi-Fi or you can leave this session and rejoin using the same link. You can rejoin on a different device and that may help as well. If you'd like to ask a question, please wiggle your mouse or touch your screen and you'll see a Q&A box appear on your screen. Click on this. If you have any questions for me or Dan, you can type them here. You can ask questions whenever and we can see these throughout the session. Even if you don't have any questions, keep an eye on the Q&A panel. If you like a particular question, you can click like. The most popular questions will come to the top of the list and we'll try to answer them first. You can open and close the Q&A box whenever you like during the talk as well. The chat button can be used if you're having any technical issues, but please try to keep the questions to Dan in the Q&A section. It makes it a bit easier for us to keep all the questions in one place. We really want this session to be interactive and cover the topics you're most interested in. So please do ask questions. The only silly question is one you wanted to ask, but didn't. I've activated closed captioning during the talk. If you want to switch them on, click on the button marked CC, closed captioning, and then live transcript. This is automatic subtitling, which finds some medical words hard. So we've seen trabeculectomy turned into Rebecca said to me, or Trab turned into Trump. <laughs> so first, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about Glaucoma UK for those who are new to us. Glaucoma UK is the UK's charity for people with glaucoma. We work in three main areas to prevent glaucoma sight loss. Firstly, we campaign to raise awareness of the disease. We want people to know what glaucoma is and about the importance of getting your eyes tested. The earlier glaucoma is diagnosed, the less, people, less likely people are to experience sight loss. Secondly, we provide support and advice to people with glaucoma and those who care for them. We have information leaflets, a helpline, a buddy service and a patient forum, and we provide training and advice to professionals looking after people with glaucoma. All of our services are free. Finally, we fund research into the diagnosis, treatment, care and prevention of glaucoma. So I'm going to hand over to our speaker now, to Dan. Don't forget to post any of your questions in the Q&A. So Dan, over to you. Thanks, Joanna, and thanks, Rachel, and thanks to Glaucoma UK for having me on this evening. Um, yes, please, please, please keep this interactive, jovial, um, and, and it needs to fit your needs. So obviously I can't hear you or see you, but if there's anything you want to ask, please just Put your hand up, ask a question, and there's nothing too silly or too small or, or, or too foolish. So, yeah, please, please keep it interactive. So I'm going to click some buttons and share my screen with you, which hopefully is now sharing. Brilliant. And I lose all faces and just look at myself, which is rather disconcerting. Um, yeah, so I'm Dan Linfield from, um, from Guildford, um, and I'm the glaucoma lead there. 
I've been asked um, by Joanna to talk about lasers in glaucoma. They, uh, now, Glaucoma UK have a beautiful and beautifully illustrated article about glaucoma and lasers in their last issue of Insight. So the summer version, I think that's the one that's still in print now, um, but it's also available online. So we'll share that link down here eventually. Um, but it's a lovely article in words about what glaucoma lasers are and what they're about. And it's a really good resource. Um, but I'm going to do a bit more interactive and lots more pictures and lots more discussion about that laser. The first thing is this. Glaucoma lasers are not like James Bond. I'm going to debunk this right now. Um, so no one straps you down. There's no big red hot beams. They are gentle, gentle treatments. And the key thing is, as we are starting and you'll hear later, that laser is proving itself to be safer than eye drops for many types of glaucoma, which is unfathomable, but it's amazing how laser is gentler, safer, better tolerated than eye drops. We used to think of drops, then lasers, and then surgery on top, but actually laser is probably the, the first line now for many, many patients. So James Bond, out, out the window. These are the three lasers I'm gonna talk about. Um, there's also one called ECP, so endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, which I'm sure the closed captioning will get completely wrong. Um, but that one is quite niche. Um, I've had it in the past and a few hospitals have it, but it is quite niche. And many of you won't have access to it. Um, so I'll, I'll, I've deliberately left that one off to keep this talk to the majority, um, but I'm happy to answer questions about that later on but it is also discussed in that article. So first thing we talk about is laser peripheral iridotomy, what used to be the most commonly performed glaucoma laser around, maybe turning tides now, but anyway. So can you see, if I wiggle my mouse around, can you see what I'm pointing at? Can you see a, a mouse on there? No, I can't. No. Oh, okay, that's annoying. Um, that's frustrating. Okay, that's a shame. So the blue dome at the top of the cornea is so the top of the picture is the cornea, and the the sort of half cut through um, half circle on um, so the right hand side of the picture is the lens. So this is looking at somebody's drains inside their eye. Now the fluid is made the base of those arrows, and it should flow into the drain at the bottom of that blue circle, blue um, arcing cornea, which I can see my eye arrow. In this patient, their iris, the pinky brown bit, is bowing upwards. So you can see that it's meeting the top up here. And that's what's called angle closure. So nearly everyone with glaucoma has open angles. Your drain is, your iris is pushed away and the fluid can get at this point really, really easily. But in certain patients, the iris comes up too high and the fluid can't escape. And that can be a mild form or it can be a much more acute or serious form. You can even be rushed to hospital overnight with that type of glaucoma, very rarely. Um, so laser iridotomy is used to relieve that pressure. So there's a nicer picture. So this is the whole eye. The blue bit in the centre is your lens and the dome at the top is the cornea. You can see the iris, which is brown for this patient, is bowing upwards like a McDonald's M. It's raised up and it should be much flatter and lower. So what the laser does is uses a light beam to make a tiny little hole about the size of a pinhead through that iris and allow the fluid to flow through it and around it. A bit like if you you know, open, open a door on a windy day, everything rushes through. Once you make that tiny little pinhole, as long as it's big enough to let some fluid through, the fluid behind it whooshes through and the iris drops back. It reduces the pressure. There's high pressure behind and low pressure above. So it reduces the, the, the gradient, the differential of pressure. And it takes a couple of minutes on a machine. So the machine looks like a, we call this thing on the left, a slit lamp. That's how we examine, uh, examine you in clinic. Um, you put your chin on the rest and the laser machine is very, very, very similar to it. It's nearly all built into the column 
and it's just sat there. There's no straps, there's nothing to bite down on. It's all oh, that's you know absolute heresy. It's just put your chin on the rest, um, and then you sit there at the machine. We use a contact lens on the surface of the eye to allow us to see in more detail, like a magnifying glass, and it you're numbed first before you have that contact lens on your eye. So it's it's small, the eye's numbed. And it just allows the doctor or, or nurse sometimes to see that in more detail. And, and, and for the patient, it means that you can forget about blinking because a lens stops you from blinking over the top of it. As long as you're relaxed, it, it sits on very, very nicely. If you try and squeeze quite hard, it becomes a bit more difficult, but it's a very well tolerated um, a contact lens. And the whole procedure for a laser iridotomy takes well, five to 10 minutes, even if you've got a slow doctor. It's, it's very, very quick. The laser sort of clicks, is it, if you're going to have it or you've had it, you feel a kind of clicking uh, sensation, usually maybe in the eye or in your ear or at the back of the head. It's not, it's not painful. It's just an odd sort of snappy sensation, but very, very quick and very mild. And a few of those clicks in it and it's done the job. OK, this is it happening. So if anyone's gory, please look away. It's not it's not it's not scary, but this is what your doctor's going to see. So hopefully this is some nice insight. Um, so this is somebody looking at the eye and you can see towards the bottom right is the pupil. And this patient's got a brown eye and at the top of the screen is the edge of their eyelid. There is a confusing cross in, in the middle of the screen, but that's just on the camera. But it's, you're looking at the red dot. That red dot is where the laser is going to go off. So the doctor will be looking for a naturally thin part of the iris. You want to go through the easiest bit, that little yellow arrow. And then when they press the button, you'll see it just, just click. Okay, and it's going to click through. And eventually there'll be a big whoosh of fluid. You can start to see the fluid whooshing through now. And once the hole's big enough, the fluid will whoosh through. Okay, there it goes. So there's a little bit of pigment just dropping down and there's a fluid whoosh. You can't see it in 2D, but it, the whole thing just pushes back. Okay, and that's for four clicks, that cloud of pigment, that arrow is showing you that cloud. It's letting the fluid through and it's suddenly whooshing. It shows there's built up pressure behind the iris. This hole is fractions of a millimeter in size. It is absolutely tiny. You normally can't see those little crypts in your iris. If your friends look at you, those little natural hollow spots. Um, like craters on the moon, you can't see those with the naked eye and you can't see a laser iridotomy usually with a naked eye. You have to have a machine to find it. There is an element of the darker your eye, the more clicks you need. So if you're lucky to have a, a thin blue eye or a gray eye or a green eye, the laser may even go through with one or two clicks. It's, it's, it's depending on how thick your iris is. But that's what we see from the, the operator, the doctor's point of view. And um, this is a picture of one that's been done. So LPI stands for laser peripheral iridotomy. It's a big photo and blown up, but you can see up the top, there is a little tiny hole. It's, it's deliberately peripheral. It's the edge of the iris and it's normally hidden under the eyelid or in clear space at the side. So you'd have to look very hard to see that the naked eye and it's normally hidden or partially obscured. Remember, this is a, a flash photograph. So there's lots and lots of light pouring into this eye. If you ever sat on those machines, the lights that, that shine at you are very, very bright indeed. So it's very rare to, be able to see this just walking around the high street. OK, but once it's done, it's pushed it back. Laser is a, a holding measure. It's the most common treatment for um, angle closure. It's the, it's the safest, it's the easiest. It's often done to both eyes on the same day because if you've got it in one eye, you've nearly always got it in both, nearly always. But it's not the definitive fix. So you may need some more work later. Maybe not, maybe. But the reason why you may have laser and then not just be discharged off to high street optician for the rest of your life is that some people's drains respond to the laser but not fully. So some people have the laser and they're checked a few weeks later, everything's hunky-dory, off we go and we say goodbye. We're never gonna truly say you're totally fine. You're always gonna have an eye check with your optician every couple of years maybe, and everybody's gonna be looked at as a safety net across the whole community. But sometimes laser drops the iris right back 
and then we know you're safe, in which case we will say goodbye. Sometimes the laser works a little bit and it looks fine. We might bring you in for monitoring with ourselves or optician monitoring, um, but we will keep a watch from a distance on your drains and on your pressures. And very, very rarely the laser's performed. The little hole is good, it's clear and it's flowing, but the iris refuses to budge backwards. And the culprit then is usually that the lens inside the eye is just taking up too much space. So it's just a physical cramped eye. You have possibly got a, a naturally shorter eye than other people have. And the lens is taking up more space inside the eye than other people. So it's all just a bit tight. What this picture is trying to show here is the top left hand corner is a is an intraocular lens. So this is if you have cataract surgery, many some of you may have had that already. We remove the normal human lens and we put a plastic lens back in its place. It's not a skin or a film. It's the whole lens being removed and upgraded. So that's classically done if you can't see clearly, but some people with angle closure or types of glaucoma where the drains are tight may have your doctor talking about doing an earlier than normal lens replacement operation. So if there's cataract there, it may become a little bit sooner to take it out. And sometimes we talk about lens replacement surgery before there's even cataract there. If we can't get the drains open with lasers, then taking out this big bulky lens and putting this very thin lens in, you can see at the bottom picture, it's very, very thin. It allows everything to drop back. Okay, so that's why sometimes you may talk about cataracts, even though you've got glaucoma, because they're, they're inter, interlinked. Any questions about that so far? I think uh, nothing through yet, okay. So we're now going to move on to selective laser trabeculoplasty, which again, the closed captions will struggle with. Um, so it's called SLT um, for short. Okay, so a very similar setup. So the same machine actually. So the left hand machine in our hospital does both the laser iridotomy and the SLT. It's two in one. Um, and the top bit, a bit above the microscope pieces, that tiny little box is all the SLT actually is. It's that small. It's about the same size as a sort of car CD player. And then your smiley um, doctor will sit the other side of it and, and, and shoot this laser for you. Now, how does laser work? The honest answer is we're not truly sure how SLT works. We used to make a uh, uh, I used to use a laser called ALT, which was called argon laser trabeculoplasty, which actually made a little hole in the drain. It made a little tiny burn, a contraction and a hole. And that used to reduce your pressure. However, when people sadly passed away, we found that yes, that part was a hole, but actually it, it, it was quite scarred. It didn't work very well, but the bits either side of the hole we're actually working really quite nicely. So like all the best things, SLT was sort of a scum of accidents. It evolved from ALT and SLT is a very, very gentle procedure. It's just, I, I talk about it as a, as a tickle. It's a, it's a stimulation of the drain and we know we want it to have a little bit of inflammation. That's a bodily process where the eye gets a bit angry. And then we want that to cause the cells to recruit and to come in and clean it up. I often use the analogy that we want to stimulate the natural cleaning process. So we have cells inside of our drains called macrophages and monocytes for the, the detail people out there. But their job is to sort of gobble up, go around eating up all the, all the debris, all the dust inside the drains. Just like how all the dust in your bathroom goes towards the extractor fan in the, in the ceiling. You look at the extractor fan, it's full of dust, even though in the air there's not much. It all goes to one point and it gets stuck. These cells job is to clean that drain, but a bit like the NHS or your postman at Christmas, there's not enough cells to do the job well. If you give them a, bit of a nudge, if you shoot a light at them and say, come on, come on cells, work a bit harder, they go into sort of hyperactive hyperdrive and they clear the drain for you. So the pressure comes down inside the eye. It takes about six weeks to do so fully. And then it normally stays down for two or three years before it clogs up again. 
that's an average for the two to three years. You can be shorter, you can be longer. That's how averages work. But the average is about two and a half years. But because you haven't done any damage to the eye, you've not shot any holes or, or burnt it, it can be repeated again and again and again. Maybe not forever, but certainly for many, many years. And we're looking like we can do it for two or three decades, but we're not proven that yet. So what the laser does is it tickles that brown band in that picture called the trabecular meshwork. That's the sponge that runs all the way around the eye. And that's where the fluid should drain. But in glaucoma, it's nearly always the point where it gets clogged up. And if we can unclog that, the fluid can go down that arrow and into the drains and the veins and disappear. So it reduces your pressure. This is what that system looks like. So the trabecular meshwork is like a sponge of fibers. Just like if you could zoom in on your sponge, you'd see lots and lots of little crisscrossing fibers and the fluid, your pressure would naturally drain through those holes. So it's like a bathtub. Your eye is like a bath. It's the, every single glaucoma procedure we have works on this theory. You can either turn the tap down or make the drain better somehow. So some drops turn the tap down, some drops make the drains more effective. What the SLT does is makes your natural drain work better. Unlike some operations like trabeculectomy, we're basically giving you a whole new drain, but that's the simple analogy of glaucoma. It's just a bathtub theory. Okay, so SLT, you have a lens put on the eye, just like the last laser, and you can see it here on this lovely lady. Um, who's got, it stops the eye from blinking and there's a mirror in the lens that allows the light to come in and turn the corner. Your drain is inside the eye, almost back on itself. So you need to see the drains and the lens allows us to do that. This is what I see when I'm lasering. So to the bottom left is the pupil, the brown is the iris and the white is where the iris inserts into the cornea. So it's where on your eye where brown or blue meets white. We're looking in there from the inside. This is not external. And that red spot is where the laser's going to fire. So I see that, I put it on the drainage stripe, that trabecular meshwork band, and I press my little button. And it flashes a very, very short, not hot, bright pulse of light. It is laser, but you'll hear later we talked about as stimulated light therapy because laser sounds like James Bond, but it's a light that does something. That's all that laser means. And it causes little tiny bubbles on your drain. So when I press play, you can see little tiny bubbles pinging off the drains there. So the Americans call this the champagne sign. It shows that you've got a response from the drain. And if there's champagne flowing, it's probably time to celebrate. It's probably going to work. Some people have a naturally darker drain than others. So if you have a dark drain, often the laser works even better. If you're very, very pale, blue eyed, very pale drains, it still works. You have to do a bit more power from the laser to get the same bubble effect. But that's what we see. I mean, walking this spot all the way around the eye. So a full 360 degrees all the way around the whole circumference of the eye to get it to work. And it, it's a really effective treatment. On the left is, the, is a, a very, very high powered microscope. The scale here is one quarter of one millimeter. That's how small we are, it's insanely small. But that little divot, divot that little uh, crater is what the old fashioned laser used to do. It still helped the pressure, but it damaged that bit that it shot. But the picture on the right is a picture taken after the more modern SLT. Now modern, it's been around for 20 years, so it's not new. Um, but it, you can see, you can't see where it's been. There's some separation of those fibers, little holes, but they're the natural holes. There's no dent, hole, burn, divot, nothing. It's just it untouched where you've been. Hence why you can do it again and again. It's so gentle, the best microscope we've got can't see where you shot it. It's just a stimulation. This is the game changer. So this is the light study, which is changed the world of glaucoma. So research can get quite heavy. So I've deliberately made it jovial, but this was a perfectly designed piece of research by um, Professor Gazard at, at Moorfields. So he gathered together lots of patients over three years and did the perfect comparison between the two eyes. So. Patients had real laser in one eye, 
hence the red bean, and fake eye drops in the same eye, hence the bottle of Evian. They were just putting water in their eyes, but the drops looked like eye drops. So the patient didn't know what they're doing and the doctor didn't know what they're having. So we were masked. I hate the word blinded, but we were masked to what the patient was doing. So they had real laser fake drops. And in their other eye, they had real drops, but a fake laser procedure. The laser, same machine, just a flashing light that had nothing to it. So the patient and the doctor didn't know which eye had which treatment. And because the patient had, you know, either left or right eyes mixed around, there's no variability between Mrs. Jones and Mr. Jones who had a higher pressure or whatever. The same patient, you can compare the two treatments in everybody side by side. It was beautiful, really well designed. And that was a light study. This is Mr. Gazard, Professor Gazard, who is um, part of, of Thorpeham UK, and he's going to explain what the light study is and what it's proven. And I think he's much better at this than me. So I'm going to press play on his video and let him, let him talk to you. I'm Gus Gazard, I'm the Chief Investigator for the Light Trial uh, and the Director of the Glaucoma Service here at Montreal. Five, six years ago, wanted to see whether a laser treatment for lowering eye pressure would work as well as using eye drops. What we found was that using laser, a gentle focused light treatment in front of the eye that doesn't hurt, it's very painless, as the first treatment for glaucoma, was able to keep people off drops, well controlled, with good eye pressures for three years in over three quarters of patients. It's a cheaper or a less costly treatment than the eye drops. If we did this treatment for everyone across the NHS, we'd probably save around a million and a half pounds a year. But if we did this for all of the patients who already had glaucoma, then we would probably be saving tens of millions of pounds a year for the NHS. And for the patient, it means that they can have that pressure, that pressure controlled with just a focused light treatment once, twice, maybe three times over a period of many years with no medication. The results that we've just had published in The Lancet are the three-year outcomes, which was the planned length of follow-up of the study. Because we were able to recruit the patients on time to the target and look after them well and keep them in the study, so we've been funded for an extension to that project. We're very grateful to Mortal's Eye Charity for helping us to fund the continuation of the project and to keep going for a further three years. Uh, we're also very grateful for funding to be able to look at the genetics of eye disease and glaucoma in particular, and hopefully be able to start to untangle how... Okay, so it gets a bit heavy by the end, but yes, it's proving this laser is very, very effective. So the light study showed that SLT was more effective than, than a single glaucoma drop. And that was the latanoprost, the most commonly performed used drop. It gave a lower pressure in that eye versus the drops eye. It controlled the disease better. It stopped the progression of glaucoma, the visual field damage uh, over time. It meant that there was less chance of needing surgery. Surgery was very rare anyway in these groups because they were mild glaucoma. But the SLT meant you had less chance of needing glaucoma surgery, and it was more cost effective than eye drops. It even seemed to suggest that actually by having SLT, you were less likely to get a cataract than you were with using medication. But that wasn't what they were trying to prove. OK, so there's some questions come in. I think poor Joanna's lost her Internet, so I don't think she's around anymore. But um, so there's questions coming in. Um, one is um, how recent is the thinking that SLT can be repeated? Um, I've previously been informed that each angle can be treated three times. Um, yeah, you'll hear varying things about this. There's lots of different data. The, so ALT, probably not repeatable. SLT, the more modern version, is repeatable. It's different per patient. So some people, it can last six years. Others, it can last a year and a half. The key thing to also remember is, sadly, glaucoma the pressures go up over time. So for example, you started a pressure of 25 and laser worked. In five years time, it might be 28. Laser will work, but it may not get you quite as low. In 10 more years time, the pressure might be 32. So it's unfair to say the laser doesn't get you down as low as it did before because the disease has progressed a bit in the meantime. But I wouldn't be so binary as saying that three times and stop. You certainly try it more than that. I've seen patients who've had it five times and it still works. I've seen patients who've had it once, it doesn't work. 
but success rates are very, very high. It's very quick. It's very painless. And there's little wrong with trying it. it. You know, it doesn't work. It doesn't stop you doing anything else later. But I'm a huge fan of SLT. Perfect. Um, perfect. Another question is, how soon do we know whether you need to continue the drops afterwards, etc.? So SLT can be used for two main things. One is to just control the pressure. So that's with or without drops, just to get you lower. So in the light study, it's patients with pressures in, say, 30, who came down to, say, 19 with the laser. So they weren't on drops before, and they weren't on drops after, and the pressure came down. If you were on two drops and your pressure was 24, laser could still get you down to 18, but you'd have to continue the drops. Other patients, you can use laser to get off drops. If you have drops you don't like, they're giving you side effects, they're making your eyes sore, you're forgetful and miss them, or you live a busy life and you always leave them behind and, and, and you can't get hold of them, etc. Then laser can be used as a substitute for drops. You can take away a drop and put the laser on. It's not so good if you try and do too much out of it. So if you're on two drops and a high pressure, it's not going to get you off two drops and drop you down. It's, it's, it's one or the other usually. So that's, it's often confusing <coughs> what you're trying to achieve. But I think the doctor should be clear that are we doing it to get your pressure down from where it is now, in which case it's continue your current drops, or is it to swap you over, in which case your pressure will be similar to how it is now, maybe a little bit lower, but it can't do both. <coughs> Another question, um, after SLT, there's a six week period to bed in, yeah, what happens? So that's while your drains are clearing. So yes, if we are using laser to get you off a drop, it won't work straight away. So my classical thing to do would be use, use your drops for four weeks, then stop them, and then see you at six weeks, so two weeks without, and see if it's worked. But again, we need to be clear that if you're using it to reduce the pressure from too high, the drops may continue beyond. So laser SLT is not a, an operation. It's not going to get your pressures down to 10 without drops. It should be thought of as an extra medication. It's the it's an additional factor usually. Okay. What it also does is it flattens your pressure curve. So this is me trying to show that your pressures throughout the day will swing. You may hear the phrase diurnal fluctuation, but we know that pressures tend to rise and fall throughout the day. It's why that when your doctor sees you, at, you know, one day and pressures are suddenly sixteen, and last time they're fourteen. You might be worried you've gone up by two, but they're saying, don't worry. It's because throughout the day, your pressure will change. Bring you back in an hour, they'll be different. Give you a bottle of water and drink it and say, come back in an hour, it'll be different. So you shouldn't get too hung up on my pressure was 13 last night, but it's now 14 and oh goodness, that's getting worse. It's a moving target, just like blood pressure. Put the thing on your arm, press the button, it's never the same twice. And classically, not always, but classically, your pressures are highest in the mornings and they're lowest in the afternoon and evenings. So if you go from having an appointment at 8 a.m. and it's high, and then you come back in the in the afternoon a few weeks later and it's lower, some of that just can be time of day difference. So these are why the pressure is important, but don't get too hung up on the ones and the twos. There's a lot more going on. This is possibility for reducing life. Cheesy in the sound. This is, is um, this is what may change the world again further. So you're there's a thing called DSLT, it's a digital SLT. And it's trying to make SLT even more approachable, accessible, safer. Um, so rather than having a hospital doctor put a contact lens on your eye that you might find a bit sticky and sore. Um, and need to go to hospital, the dream is that this device can be used in spec savers. Um, it's an automated contact lens free laser. So it's being trialed at the moment. You put your chin on the rest. It doesn't touch you. It scans your eye and it works out where you're looking. And if you move, it moves with you. And then it will apply, as you see there, a hundred dots of laser around the drains using a very clever sort of machine gun mirror, but it will do it the whole treatment from start to finish in 1.2 seconds, which is frankly 
insane, but it will do the whole thing and it's done. So the dream is that one day, and we're nowhere near it yet, that if your pressure is high at your appointment, you just get taken around the corner, even with your optician, and they'll reduce it for you. And that will be it. It won't work for everybody. It may not work at all, but this looks very, very, very exciting. So that's digital SLT or DSLT, which is potentially coming if it's safe and proves itself, which is a long way to go. Cool. Any more SLT questions? I go along. Perfect. Okay. I've lost my mouse and my screen, Joanna, so I can't now change this. You're back. <laughs> but my mouse has died and I can't see uh, where the, how to change the questions. Um, have you got any questions you can put to me? I can't. Um, I can see one about how soon after SLT, <coughs> sorry, can I drive? So I guess it depends on are you having one eye done or both? Um, often when you go for your laser, you have drops in to constrict the pupil, which can give you a slight tight frontal headache, and they'll blur you for a few hours. But by that afternoon, or you know, three or four hours later, you should be back to normal. So most people can drive probably the next day. There'll always be exceptions to that. So people get, might get a bit sore, a bit achy, a bit sensitive to bright lights. So not everybody, but most people like the next day you can probably drive. It's, it's a minimally invasive thing to do. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to uh, cyclodiode, or you may hear it called transscleral treatment or micropulse or G6. Um, but they're all the same thing as you'll hear again. So going back to my bathtub theory of glaucoma, rather than making the drains work better, this treatment is to turn the tap down and turning it down with a laser rather than with drops. So you've seen this picture before, you've seen the, how the fluid drains to the trabecular mesh work, but the fluid emanates from where that star is, and that's called your ciliary body, and that runs in a ring around the eye again. And that's a little bunch of cells that make the pressure. They make aqueous. The chemical reaction it ends up making water. So they're made there and they flow through. So this treatment's finding a way of turning that tissue down or off. So you can access that tissue with an endoscope. You can you imagine the cataracts out of the way, the lens out of the way. You can go through with a, like a, a, a laser on a pipe and you can actually see those little lumps and switch them off, shoot them with a the laser and turn them down a bit. But it does involve some expensive kit that's not very um, uh, sturdy. Gets, it doesn't last very long in, in certain hospitals. Um, and it's quite expensive, so not everyone's got it because it tends to have, to have to buy lots of expensive kit to keep it going. So nearly everyone's got what's called cyclodiode. This is a laser where you go through the outside of the eye with a probe through the white coat of the eye called the sclera that's the sort of tennis ball skin of the eye and then you go aim through where the star is and turn it off so you put a little probe on the eye it's like a pencil or a biro with a little tiny red light sticking out through it that's going to shoot through the eye and switch off the drain and obviously the more you shoot the more you switch off the lower the pressure okay and you walk it around the eye so you can turn it all the way around, turning off the bits of the drain. So the more pressure you want to reduce, the more drops you do. It gets a bit geeky, but bear with me. So um, this is at the top. This is somebody who the old fashioned lasers used to just turn on for seconds. So three or four seconds, a laser was on. Like, and then you can see at the bottom that curve the heat inside the eye would build up. So the more the laser was on, the hotter it would get. And basically heat means inflammation, it means uh, pain, it means side effects. So the early types of these laser were quite angry inducing. They made the eye quite sore, quite red. They had a potential for causing problems. And hence this laser didn't used to be used much unless eyes were uh, unhappy. It used to be reserved for people who had quite poorly sighted eyes or had a very, very high pressure or couldn't tolerate a bigger operation like a trabeculectomy. It was sort of a get out of jail free card. Um, and that was how it was for many years. But more recent 
machines use micro pulsed laser, which means that many, many times a second, so literally to the you know nanoseconds, this laser on the yellow bars on off on off on off on off, and you can see that it can be on for even shorter amounts of time. So the bottom picture. It's on for longer, and the time between each yellow bar, each on, is shorter. But at the top, it's barely on with a really long pause before the next one. And therefore, the eye heats up, it cools down. It heats up, it cools down. So it, it doesn't ever really get hot. It never really gets much energy, but it still has the effect of turning off the tap. So we get the same effect, but without the collateral inflammation, soreness, pain, etc. Um, so that's why these lasers are sort of making it resurgent. So the technology, the ability to control things, so using micropulsed or even now ultrasound, you can use focused ultrasound, but turning the tap down in a gentler way. So rather than destroying it and burning it, it's just saying, calm down, switch off, just don't make quite so much fluid, please. And they're becoming more popular once again. So you may hear those talked about. So in summary, um, laser is a big spectrum of procedures. So you hear the word laser, you think about having your eyes laser to change your prescription. That's basically like a lathe or diabetic patients who have their eyes laser with a hot destroying thermal laser. Glaucoma lasers are not like that. SLT is very, very, very mild and arguably safer than eye drops. And the PI, the iridotomy laser, again, is a couple of minutes. SLT is becoming, in my life, it's become first line treatment and standard of care. So on day one of diagnosis with a high pressure or glaucoma, I will be offering laser or drops straight away. And most people now say laser, please, if you if you explain it clearly and, 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 and debunk the myths of James Bond movies. But laser is nearly always a first line choice. And I think that's going to get even more popular. So as people get used to it, mentally and doctors get accustomed to doing it and once you buy more machines which are not enough at the moment it will become more popular and more readily available and i know that glaucoma uk are working with patients and nice to make this happen more quickly and that was all on the back of gus gazard's amazing research so um, big thanks to gus for changing the world for that it's very very safe it's cost effective it's not often in medicine that something is new it's better it's safer and it's cheaper that's amazing but the the numbers of you know people are talking about saving 15 million pounds a year by using a new treatment and you can if you're lucky not need drops either afterwards it's it, it really is a game changer perfect and in our world lasers are almost on the parallel to medication so we're not seeing this you know it, 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 when i mention lasers to the patients they go oh no i don't want that i'd rather have my drops but for us we see laser as, as the same or even gentler we're not seeing it as surgery people think that laser is a type of surgery and it's scary because it's a big thing but actually laser is is a, a lower tier lower rung of the ladder okay perfect right Thank Hi you. Dan, can you hear me at all? It's Philip ah, from Glaucoma UK. Yeah. Hello, hello Dan. Uh, I do apologise to everyone. We're having some technical difficulties here. Joe has apologised profusely, and I've just run onto the computer. Uh, <laughs> thank, you. thank you, Dan. Sorry about that. Sorry, we've kind of left you hanging. Um, no, sorry. I'm a little bit behind, but I have a couple of questions here that have come up on my on my grenades. Um, are you okay to take those? I yeah, promise. Yeah, uh, I, my my mouse has died. I can click it. <laughs> I can't just scroll it. So um. Oh, OK. No worries. No worries. And um, apologies for anyone who's asked a question and it's not come up on my list. What we'll do is we'll make sure that um, this will be a recording. We'll have a look at what questions have come up. We'll make sure we get back to everybody on them. And I've got a couple here. Uh, one says here, um, I wear contact lenses. Is it possible to use soft contact lenses after SLT? Yes, completely. Um, yes, I would give it. So you may be given some anti-inflammatory drops after the treatment sometimes steroid drops and those drops may not be officially contact lens safe so you may have to leave it out for that um, but after a few days definitely and actually i'd argue that if you've got lenses a lot of the glaucoma drops may aggravate the surface of the eye and actually slt may be better for you because you don't put a drop in every day that's going to upset the surface potentially um, so yeah S uh, contact lenses definitely not a, a a barrier definitely not 
That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I've got one here. Um, if SLT is unsuccessful first time round, uh, could you have it again? Would it oh, be good, yeah, really good question. The answer is probably not. Um, some people may try it again. I think it needs to be done by someone who knows what they're doing. Um, it, it, it's it's not just a shoot and it will work. It's there's a bit of a skill to it. There's a bit of adjustment of the amount of energy. So a, a more senior doctor may be braver to turn it up slightly to get the result. Um, but you normally keep doing the laser and see those bubbles on the picture, those bubbles from the drains. So if if you've had a, a treatment that's had a significant amount of energy, the a right amount of laser used, and you haven't responded, it's probably not worth doing it again. Probably not. Um, but you need to make sure it's been done well the first time. In fairness, it's quite rare to not get a response. Um, it, it, the key thing often when it gets it's you've not responded is you've asked too much for it. So it's either reduce your pressure on the same drugs or no drugs, or take the pressure the same by removing the drug and putting the laser on. But often you hear lasers failed or not worked. If you've tried to get rid of two drugs and reduce your pressure, it's just too much to ask. That's not a failure. That's just unrealistic expectations from the, from the start. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've got one here that came through to us earlier. Um, when the ciliary body has been burned by enough um, laser to reduce and stabilize IOP, can the ciliary body regenerate to its former condition or does it stay permanently damaged? Yeah, good question. So it definitely regenerates in some form. Um, the bits that haven't been shot or turned down tend to wake up a bit more, um, but there's always almost certainly a, a permanent impairment of fluid so yes it, it's always slower than it was before but you may get some resurgence and i guess how much resurgence you get depends on how hard it was treated and, and how much and which type of laser you used um, but yeah, you do get you get a bit of bounce back yes and um, what well, i've got one here um what sort of laser treatment will i have had during cataract and eye stent surgery Ah, so eye stent is not a laser. So eye stent is a little tiny metallic device, like a tiny drinking straw. So we've seen that trabecular mesh work, that spongy band. And then rather than trying to stimulate it to work harder, the stent basically punches through it. So like putting a drink straw through a carton of orange juice, it allows the fluid through the, through the drains, but only where the stent is. And that stays in you forever. So that punches through the drain and lets the fluid have, go back into the veins. Um, so there's no laser for eye stent. It's a, it's a, it's a metallic titanium device. It's yes. tiny. Wonderful. It's a MIG, isn't it? I think, is it? Is that what it is? It's a, is it yeah, one? MIG. Yeah, so MIG is, right. stands for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. So there's lots of little de like devices now. That, Which is a whole nother seminar, I think, yeah, probably. It's a whole nother webinar. Yeah. On. I'll happily come back, but uh, <laughs> yeah, not, not, not in, well, in 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, somebody's saying here, um, having SLT on Tuesday, heard it may also affect the other untreated eye positively. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Why is this? Yeah. Oh, very good question. We don't really know how ST works the first time around, and never mind why it affects the contralateral eye. But <laughs> the thought is it's stimulating cells to go to the to, to the trabecular mesh work, and that's probably done by cell messaging. So if that message has been sent out in one eye, you may get a bit of increased cellular activity in the other eye. But it's a bit vague. It's a bit vague. I honestly don't know. I don't think anyone does. It's wonderful. I love the thing of saying we still don't really know. No, I know. Look, we're still I not know. really sure why. It's the best thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, yeah. Please have a laser. We're not sure how it works. <laughs> but it does. But it does work. It's, it's working on cellular level. It's working on messengers and cells, individual cells. It's it's not making a big hole. So it's doing something very gentle on a cellular level, which you can't see by looking inside the eye. No. Amazing stuff, really, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Um, that's all the questions I've got at the moment. Um, I'm just going to give anyone a moment. If I haven't asked your question, you may have to retype it. As I said, apologies for our slight technical um, issues here. Um, but I am not getting anything else yet. What I would suggest to people is if you have a question on SLT, please, please either contact us on the helpline um, or email us and we will be getting, uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, just to finish off, um, Dan, are you okay if I go on to my last slides just yeah, to finish of off, if I can access them? Um, let me see if I can do this. So I've kind of just jumped on uh, with my uh, children behind me. So apologies if uh, 
<laughs> suddenly we get interrupted. Um, okay, let me just come to this last one. And um, okay. Um, Right, there we go. Um, first of all, Dan, thank you so, so much for uh, giving up your time. In fact, I've actually had another couple of questions. Dan, sorry, I'm going to keep you while you're here. That's Just because right. of my technical uh, issues. Here we go. Are there any risks with SLT? Yeah, so uh, nothing in this world is without a risk, including crossing the road or having breakfast. Um, mm -hmm. Everything has a risk. But the, the key thing is the risks of laser are low and, mm -hmm. and proven to be less than the risks of drops. But <clears throat> the the big one is a slight tendency towards having a slightly red and achy eye, a bit sensitive to light. I routinely give my patients drops to settle that down. So I give everybody a drop to calm it. And nearly everybody, 95, 97% of people, a few days later are totally back to normal. Many feel nothing at all the next day. Mm -hmm. There's a risk of the pressure spiking. So before it goes down, it may go up. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, from the study, I think was a one in 800 chance of that happening. Um, so that's often screened for, but hospitals are starting to not even check that an hour later because the risk of it is so low. And then we're getting into really, really rare risks. So it can temporarily change your prescription slightly um, and it can affect the clarity of the front of the eye, the cornea, which can affect the visual quality. Um, but permanent visual impairment from laser is horrendously rare. We're talking of ones in millions. So for most people, it's very, very, very safe and safer than the alternative, which is drops. Drops have a risk as well. Um, but the risk is a daily risk versus a laser risk on one day. But no, no, yeah, very, very low risk, very low risk. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. And hopefully uh, you've put some people's minds at rest there as well. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, yeah, thank you, guys. Thank you so much for everybody to join us today. Um, I just want to kind of close this session off um, by saying, as I said, um, if you have any questions or queries that haven't been answered tonight, apologies again if we, we haven't kind of got to you there. But please contact our helpline. We're open from 9.30 till 5 from Monday to Friday at Glaucoma UK. Um, or you can email us at helpline at glaucoma.uk. Um, our next talk's coming up. Next one's in two weeks' time. Um, that next one's called Who Can Help Me If I'm Losing My Sight to Glaucoma? Um, that's going to be at three o'clock on the 21st of October. Um, you can sign up for that now. Um, and other upcoming talks uh, before Christmas, we've got a special all about eye drops. We're then doing some glaucoma safe yoga. Uh, which will be a lot of fun. We're doing two sessions, a standing session and a sitting session, but you have to register because that's limited places. We're doing a session on glaucoma and cataracts. Um, and then we're going to be finishing off at Christmas with glaucoma and driving, which we've just got confirmed. And that's now up on our website, ready to um, log into. Um, but all that's left for me to say is thank you again, Dan. Thank you so much for giving up your time today um, to answer these okay. questions. We really really appreciate it um, thank you everybody tonight for joining us um, best wishes and we hope to see you at another webinar in the future many thanks